All right. Hi, um, everyone. I'm Kendall Story, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2021 Brooklyn Book Festival for a conversation with Peter Ho Davies, Brandon Hobson, and Kristen Arnett. Um, before we start, I just want to let everybody know that the books by the authors on this program can be purchased in the link below. Peter Ho Davies' most recent novel is A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. Other books include The Fortunes, winner of the Annisfield Wolf Award and a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, The Welsh Girl, long listed for the Booker Prize, and a London Times bestseller, as well as two acclaimed collections of short stories. His work has appeared in Harper's The Atlantic, The Parish Review and Granta, and has been anthologized in Prize Stories, The O. Henry Award, and Best American Short Stories. Born in Britain to Welsh and Chinese parents, he now teaches at the University of Michigan. Brandon Hobson is the author of The Removed, Where the Dead Sit Talking, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and winner of the Reading the West Award and other books. His fiction has won a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in the Best American Short Stories 2021, McSweeney's, Conjunctions, Noon, American Short Fiction, and elsewhere. He teaches creative writing at New Mexico State University and at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Hobson is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation tribe of Oklahoma. And lastly, but not leastly, Kristen Arnett is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, Mostly Dead Things, and the story collection Felt in the Jaw. A queer writer based in Florida, she has written for the New York Times, Guernica, Buzzfeed, McSweeney's, The Guardian, Salon, and elsewhere. She has been a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award and a winner of the Ninth Letter Literary Award in Fiction and the Coyle Book Award. All right, hello everyone. Um, so we are here to discuss your three brilliant novels which are quite different from one another stylistically and in the various themes that they explore, but which are united by the subject of family. And um, it seems a little reductive to call them all family novels when they're also novels about loss and memory, about inherited trauma and queerness and shame and love. But since family is what brings us here together today, um, I'd like to start by asking very broadly, um, what drew you to write about family in these novels, either as a vessel to explore other themes or as a theme itself? Anyone can jump in. No one ever wants to go first. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, let's just throw myself out here. Uh, I, I think this is a good way to start is that um, I'm very much drawn to the idea of writing about families, of the idea of like, uh, I mean, maybe twofold for myself. First of all, I'm very deeply invested in the idea of families, like deeply messy. Like the most human idea I can think of is like to think about like how households exist and like what a family looks like, you know, like, is that like, you know, a traditional kind of family? Is it like family that's just been collected and brought together? Like, what does that look like? And the second part of that is that I'm deeply invested in how families function because I feel like households are just stories and like how those stories kind of knit together um, and how they diverge um, from each other, even when people are telling the same story. And so to me, like, thinking and writing about families never gets boring, which is something I feel like I, I get bored very easily. But like the, the idea of like thinking and writing about or reading about families, honestly, is like the myriad ways in which like everyone inside a household is essentially an unreliable narrator. Um, like everybody has main character syndrome, but also is like deeply unreliable. And like the, the you know, shared stories, shared lore, like shared like household narratives of how like family and like lineage is constructed but like also like how those diverge from each other is like something that never get that I'm constantly fascinated with maybe is like a good way to to maybe start out with <laughs> yeah absolutely I I it's funny that you should it was funny when you said boredom um I I was reminded of I think in in P Peter's novel and then I went and quickly looked at one of the many um, lines that I underlined uh, in the book, and it's this: there's a mother and father, um, and the mother is lamenting. It's so boring. 
about just parenthood <laughs> and and you know and I and, and I just remember thinking and then the husband responds boredom is good for writers um I thought wow how exceptional I wonder if anyone agrees with that <laughs> <laughs> although they go on I think to point out that um what well, the boredom is the um the sort of soil for creativity and daydreaming. We all know this as kids, I think, in some ways, but I think the character of the wife gets, I think, the best lines in the book, points out that um, when adults are bored, they just masturbate, right? So there's a kind of way that we might think of it this as daydreaming and maybe think about it in slightly <laughs> stranger ways. Um, it's funny, I really like the way Kristen was talking about, you know, the way we think about into family. I really like that idea of everybody in the family being an unreliable narrator. I think that's exactly right. Um, I think for me, leaning into that space goes back, um, boy, it goes back 20 years, I think, to my second book that was very much about parental child relationships. But at that point, I wasn't a parent myself. And I was thinking into the, the mystery of who we are, right? Where we come from? How did our parents meet? You know, as somebody of, um, uh, you know, who's biracial, I think the, the strange odds of my parents meeting is kind of a mystery and a fascination to me. So I've always been intrigued by that. And I guess we're always drawn to that space of what were our parents like before us, right? That completely unknown territory. Um, and it's taken me 20 years, even though that book also has elements where I'm anticipating parenthood and sort of writing into my imagined anxieties about it. It took me 20 years to sort of return to that subject as a parent going, hey, you thought you had imagined anxieties 20 years ago. Well, let me tell you now from the, the future of your life in some ways. Mm. And I guess it's my turn. I'll I'll just add um, also that I like what Kristen said about uh, the unreliable narrator. And I think that, I mean, for me, um, the family has a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of generational trauma, I think, that I was interested in writing about with, with this book and always approaching the the question of what is home, what, really what is family, um, and, and, and how trauma, uh, I, I write a lot about that, so how that plays a role in uh, the family unit and uh, with healing and, and uh, coping, those kinds of things. Yeah, and you can feel that, you know, that interest in, in various ways in, in all three of those books, in of the books, I think, but of course, most kind of epic in scope in your novel, Brandon, and, and also in this kind of, in, even in, in the telling of the story, you feel this expansiveness of time. And, um, and, and even in, I mean, not to, not to jump straight into it, but I, well, I really wanted to talk about the styles of, of all of your books. And, and Brandon, I mean, so the removed is told in four alternating perspectives, all first person, perhaps five if you count the prologue, which is in this omniscient voice, right? And three of these voices are family members, and the fourth is Sala, an immortal spirit. Um, and I wonder if you can, I, I wonder if you'd want to speak a little bit about, I mean, I, I want to hear everyone talk about the styles of their books, but I'm curious about how you chose those four perspectives in order to tell this particular story. Well, I I think early on I had Chala. Uh, um, Chala is a shortened version of Chala Gi. So Chala um, is the, the ancestor. Chala Gi, by the way, is a Cherokee word for, for Cherokee. Um, and so Chala's voice I was thinking about early on because I wanted to include some of the Cherokee mythology and some of those stories that I'd heard when I was younger and that I've read about and, and um, to sort of have this sort of ghostly uh, the, all those stories that come out of creation stories and that come out of um, all of you know, sexuality and uh, how um, how things just are the way that the land presents them to be and the way that the land is and the way that the land remembers and deals with trauma in the same way that people deal with trauma and um, so Chala Chala's voice I think came early on um, and uh, Maria. Uh, sorry, Maria, yeah, Maria's, the mother's sections were actually written in third person early on. And um, my editor said I should change that to be all first person. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Why, why so, was that? I'm so curious. I, I guess because it was so uneven, maybe I had the other, all the other perspectives um, and all the other points of view were in first. And then she said, um, maybe that one should be in first too. I, I wasn't real comfortable doing that, I guess, because um, I, it, it was, uh, you know, Maria is an older woman and I felt, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of like acting, mm. um, you know, you have these, you, you take on these characters, right? And I wasn't sure that I could get her voice down. And so what I did was I talked to um, a friend, a good friend of my mom's who uh, lost her son, her only son. And in some ways this, this book is based off the killing of um, the from uh, the Good Blanket family in Oklahoma, um, our, our native family, and their son was killed by a police officer. But I spoke to my mom's friend and um, who had lost her son as well, and um, really tried to get that perspective down, her voice down, um, which was really difficult. I think I, I was, you know, third person early on was a way for me to sort of try to not get too close. I mean, it was kind of a close third, but, but it, you know, I was just sort of timid about, I think, you know, trying to take that on and, and I wasn't sure that I could pull it off. Um, here's a much older woman who had been through uh, the loss of her, uh, of, of uh, her son and dealing with her husband's Alzheimer's. Mm. And um, uh, so, so, but, but the other ones, I think Edgar, who enters the Darkening Land, which is a mythical, myth, mythological place that's mentioned in Cherokee traditional stories, um, his, his sections were probably the most fun because of, um, they were, um, they were first person, but they were, uh, you know, they existed in this alternate reality. Um, and then Sonia, um, I could, I could clearly, I clearly knew Sonia's voice, um, and so uh, I, I found a lot of pleasure. I always, you know, tell students about getting pleasure from writing, and whatever point of view feels the most, I guess, the most pleasurable to you is a good place to start, and that's just kind of why um, I think I enjoy close third and, and, and first much more than a more omniscient, uh, which is why only that prologue is three pages or whatever it is uh, in the omniscient. And, and then, you know, I'm done with that. I, I've got to move on because just, you know. <laughs> well, I really admired the world building in the novel. And I also really felt, I was so curious to hear you talk about, um, you know, the first person switching from third. And I think that that kind of productive distance the distance of you know third person even though you're still close can sometimes allow you to you know reach places that you weren't able to or perhaps and and i think maybe to turn this around to peter maybe just to talk about you know obviously being so close to a subject may, what formal choices did you make to handle this material um and and to tell the story that you wanted to tell yeah i mean the uh, the book um I guess occupies that odd and and for me maybe profitably slightly undefined space of autofiction. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I could define autofiction, um, but I, I but I admire a lot of books that are called that, so it's nice to think of it into that space. Um, and so the father and the mother and the child are just described in those terms; they're not named, um, but it does feel like a very close third with just a little bit of room. I, I'm always interested in. Uh, slightly disowned first person so it feels like that character is very close to me um i've sometimes written in second person and i like that as a kind of self-alienated first person or a kind of first person in denial and this feels as though it's got something of that quality a slightly distant sense of the self speaking about itself i think in various ways um I, you know one of the things i was thinking though into your question and thinking about both brand's book and, and kristen's book and really admiring this uh, um I, I admire and envy their facility to enter different points of view in those books. Um, and and I, I was suddenly feeling a little, um, 
uh, oh, just like, God, I should have done that. <laughs> that would have been a good <laughs> idea. Um, but, I, but I think it's partly that I, it's a story about parenting and thinking very much about the father's perspective. I'm also very conscious of uh, that being a limited perspective. It doesn't include uh, the mother's perspective, the wife's perspective, the child's perspective. Um, and uh, what I think I tried to do, partly because the, the book is told um, and evolved um, in these very short vignette type sections, um, I think it partly grew out of writing some of it when my son was very young and just those stolen moments when he was napping and so you only get 40 minutes, I can, I can maybe write a page, maybe a section, but it's hard to build a long scene or a whole chapter. Um, and then I think in retrospect, it feels like that's some of the ways I remember the experience of parenting a young child. I've only got little flashes of memory in a strange way. Um, so again, those vignettes felt right for that. But I realized too that the gaps, and I think the book begins to speak into this, um, the gaps between the sections are in a way an invitation to the reader to read between the lines just a little bit to think um, that there is another story here that the wife might represent or the, or the mother might speak into, or indeed that the child might speak into as well. And so the idea was to try and suggest, I'm not telling a, a whole story here, just a perspective on that. So I'm hoping the, uh, even though I'm not throwing my voice as successfully as my, my colleagues on the panel here into other voices and other perspectives, um, that I'm inviting the reader to imagine those voices and perspectives out there in the world as well. That's exactly how I felt reading it. I mean, of course, we're so, we're used to we're a little more used to seeing the fragmented style um, in contemporary literature now. And I think, I mean, I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but I often see it, and you, it, it often is women using the style. Yeah. And I do think often mothers, because of of this stealing of stealing of time throughout the day. And this, you know, it makes me think about, you know, just in general, I mean, um, parenthood is a much more embraced topic in contemporary literature now among writers of all genders and identities, whereas before it seemed to be relegated to um, women writers whose experiences often weren't taken so seriously. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if anyone wants to talk about this shift and what, what we think it means kind of culturally or, or what it means to us personally. Thinking about parenthood, writing a book about like lesbian mothers, um, specifically like in Florida, um, I was thinking a lot about because um, I, I was um, interested in the idea of like being like very I loved close third for like a, especially for a perspective inside of a household. I think that's like fascinating to like think about like close third for um, like because it also like tells the reader that they're safe a little bit and like lures them into this false sense of security, which is delightful. Um, <laughs> I like any time I'm reading a book where I feel like uh, somebody has lulled me into a space where it's like, well, I, I thought I agreed to one thing and here I am. But um, okay, all this to say, I just feel like I'm just trying to trick a reader, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I was thinking a lot about like, um, I wanted to write a book about like lesbian parenthood that was like, I don't know, the idea of write, about writing queerness quite often is this, like, the idea of, like, being, like, a gold medal, like, LGBTQ plus person, and I was, like, I'm not interested in that at all. Um, I'm interested in, like, the very messy ways in which people choose to live, and so I was, like, I'm super fascinated about thinking about the ways in which, like, these two mothers, specifically this one mother who's very close third we're into, fails like I was like where's like the failure in the household and I think I think the failures in families and then the failures in things in life tell us like so much more than the successes uh um and I also was just like it's like the kind of idea of like the kind of I was like I as a messy dyke myself I was like I don't want to like I was like, I'm less interested in the ways in which I was like, oh, I, su I succeeded in this thing. And I was like, what are, what are the, like, the 10, 12, 15, 25 times that I failed at something? And, and how often does failure sit inside a household? And how often do we try and like scrub that? Um, because it's like, 
it's like, oh, we don't want to talk about like the failure of like something that's happening inside of something. But the failure is the thing that feels like the most significant to me. So like in working in this book, I was like, I, I want to write into the discomfort of things, first of all, because I think discomfort is very funny. Um, as a person who's like constantly trying to make a joke out of anything, I was like, discomfort is very funny to me. But also like, I, I want to see like queer people just fucking bombing I was like I was like I want to see like you know like somebody like just like not doing well and that's a, that's an interesting story to me and I was like you know like somebody who's like I'm gonna be a mom oh god I suck at it and also you know I'm a lesbian like that was like the most interesting kind of I was like can I make a book out of this oh god somebody else talk now <laughs> <laughs> You did. You did make a book out of it. And it was a book I enjoyed reading immensely. Um, I mean, I think exactly what you've said, the, the messiness and and the, there's a very important strain of humor in, in the writing, which you which you touched on that um, I didn't feel that I was, you know, there was nothing didactic about about it. And yet it felt really kind of revelatory, like, oh, yeah, this the fact that and also, I don't know, maybe strangely, oddly American it struck me as very American, this like, you were kind of told that you could have everything and that you could have this whole, this whole life. And, you know, this, this actually, there's echoes of this in all of your books, this kind of, um, this feeling of a, a promise that was made to you and, you know, that you've overcome so much and you, you've accomplished so much and here you are ready to have it all. And yet it's just incredibly disappointing and there's so much loss and so much tragedy. And, um, but there's a, but there's also a strain of love in each of your books too, um, even alongside all of that violence and disappointment, which I really appreciated. Um, yeah, I, you're, making, you're, make, you're making me think, Kendall. You know, we were talking earlier about the challenges of writing into family spaces. Um, I, I think one of them is just, um, you know, it's that feeling. You know, when you have a, a, a young child. Um, that experience is incredibly intense, and yet you also feel like so many other people had exactly the same experience, right? So when you first have it, it feels incredibly fresh to you, but then when you think about writing into it, it feels like I'm just telling everybody what they already know in a way. So there's something about the, um, the normality of that, the banality of it almost in a strange way that makes it hard to make fiction out of. Um, but one of the things that I think I was thinking about a little bit and I was thinking about this a lot reading your book, Kristen, is that feeling of, there's a kind of tyranny of the normal, um, but also I think what's so poignant often about family narratives is there's family narratives where there's also that yearning for the normal, for families that I, I maybe can't, can't imagine it or can't get to that place because of circumstances, because of the nature of the child, because of the nature of the family in various ways. Um, so there's kind of a negotiation there between trying to keep up appearances as Kristen is talking about, and that, that's the pressure on us in those regards, but also kind of this, um, residual yearning to be, if only we could be like other people, because that feels like the place of happiness in the strange sense. Yeah, if, if, to, to add on that, it seems like, I don't, I don't know that it's still talked about anymore. I mean, I have, I have two boys. Um, and I certainly don't talk, say anything about the American dream. Like what used to be the American dream was as long as you work hard, you'll, you, you, you'll be happy, right? And, and um, find find that family right and and all that leads to happiness which is absolutely not true right that's no longer not been the american dream for a long time i think and, um, that's sort of what yeah what's making me think about that um i because i think that you know family uh, for, for many it's just if i can have a family if i can be a part of a family Right, especially when you start talking about homeless teenagers and, and kids uh, who are um, fostered from house to house, that becomes it's sort of fantasy as, as long as someone will take me in, everything will be, will be great. Everything will work out and it's just not the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I certainly, I certainly agree. And I think particularly now and maybe maybe this is one of the reasons why parenthood and family are having a sort of another moment in contemporary literature um, is because I think we're all understanding that family can look a million different ways. 
um, and also can be disappointing in a million different ways or can evade us in a million different ways. And, and, and that, you know, it's not necessarily um, that, that just having one and, and also having love and having all of these things just doesn't, doesn't spare you from, um, you know, from, from enormous trauma and, um, and, and, you know, tragedy and disappointment. Um, and that it's, yeah, it's so hard and it is more of a choice, I would say, um, you know, maybe going back to thinking a little bit more about, about Peter's book in particular, but, you know, the decision to have a family where, where I think it was once sort of taken for granted or, or just made because it was, that was the expectation. Whereas now we live in a time, um, at least in our society, where having a, having a family is quite, quite a lot more intentional um, than perhaps it once was. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I suppose there's a way in which, um, if we go back far enough, we might think about, um, you know, the marriage plot as a driver for the novel. It's about choice. It's about two people coming together. But I think when we think into those traditional narratives, the 19th century narratives, the idea of coming together in marriage presupposes eventually having a family. But it feels as though the choice point has moved into the next, the, the question of beyond the romantic coming together. It's that feeling of do we lean into the next generation? And maybe there's also... I think for all of us culturally and, and socially, kind of an anxiety about inheritance, about the next generation, about what we're leaving behind, I think, in various ways, which is up the ante from the level of the personal into a, a set space of the um, the community, maybe even the global space in some way. Yeah, to go back to something we were saying earlier, to tie it through, we, family is something I can't remember if someone said fraught earlier, but it's obviously something at once universal and fraught for so many people. And I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the pitfalls of writing about something so sensitive and personal, particularly in cases when you know, we're pulling from our own lives and our families. I mean, Brandon, you were just speaking about inhabiting someone's, someone's very personal experience um, and one that's quite, that's quite tragic and fraught. And of course, Peter writing something so close to yours and Kristen pulling, pulling certain things from, from your own experience. Um, yeah, I wonder if you can talk about the, the challenges of, of that, of that process and, and whether or not it was challenging for people close to you as well. well were you asking me specifically Any, personally? Anyone. Oh, okay. You're, you're encouraged <laughs> to start, yeah, thanks. Um, well, it's, it, I mean, this book was challenging. My last book was challenging as well because in some ways they're very personal. Um, but I, um, I don't know that it was, it was difficult for anybody around me. Um, and I, I tend to not talk about what I'm working on um, with, with, my kids or, or my, my spouse um, necessarily. And then not, not because I don't want to hear their feelings, it's just because I don't, I don't feel, I don't know. I, I don't, um, it's, it's very odd to, to talk about unless it's with someone who, whom I, I trust for feedback and that I'm like my, my agent or my editor or someone, of mm -hmm. course, seems to only be the, the people that I really, um, talk about it working in its narrative space, but I, I, uh, um, I don't talk too much about it. So I don't know that what I'm working on ever affects um, anyone else around me. Mm -hmm. If that, if that. No, it certainly does. Yeah. yeah, I was, I, that's so interesting to me though, in terms of process that you kind of protect that space for yourself, or maybe it's not so much protecting as, you know, understanding what feedback is actually useful to you in your process, as opposed to, you know, who knows, just something something that might that might muddle or or kind of you know complicate your experience of writing. I, I and, and I'll just add this very quickly because I'm much more interested in hearing what they have to say than hearing myself. But I I, um, I, I do occasionally when I when I talk about traditional Cherokee stuff, want to um, ask someone um, from the tribe about their thoughts about it because I never want to make anyone mad or, or disrespect anyone within the, w within my tribe. And so, um, so I, so I generally have a conversation there, especially when it has to do with, um, something spiritual or, or, 
uh, something very traditional. Um, so, um, so there's that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Kristen? Oh, I, I am so fascinated listening to Brandon talk about like the idea of like, I, I do think that there's like, like the ways in which like ideas generate or like how we come up with like the things that the little germ that like becomes like the possibility of a story um, feels like very, I don't want to say like, I don't know, language is like expansive, but also like limiting. Um, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, I don't want to like say the thing if it's not the thing that I actually mean. And so like sometimes like the people that are closest to you, especially inside of a household or like, I don't know, any kind of people that you talk with about your passions and your dreams or your art or any kind of thing, it's difficult to be like, here's the kind of seed of something that I'm like, thinking of and be like because I don't want to say it wrong um I don't know like I don't know the right way I don't even know the right way to say it right now but um I do I do know that like in writing like with teeth specifically it was like a book that I was like I could see the shape of it sometimes like a novel feels like a thing where um like short fiction feels like um like a captured moment inside of like a snow globe maybe a little bit like a little bit of like a captured little thing inside like I can see the entirety of the thing um but like a novel feels like a shape to me quite often and when the shape comes to me then I'm kind of chasing after like how the shape of it feels and like with teeth like became this kind of weird like helix about like like family stories like a kind of like ways in which they like are connected but don't touch and it wasn't that um it wasn't that I did, I, I wasn't thinking about like the ways in which like somebody might like question me on it. My ex-wife did ask me <laughs> she was, after the book was coming out, she was like, how much of this is me? And I'm like, it's fiction, none. <laughs> but, uh, like, I mean, we all have that shit. I mean, it's always like somebody being like, how much of this is me? And it's like, it's a novel, okay. Yeah. But like, um, I don't know. I mean, it was like a thing because I was thinking very, I am a mother. I have a 21 year old son. Um, and I like, I was like, you know, what was my, ex what was my personal experience thoughtfully like thinking of like my, my, my experience is not <laughs> the same as what's in this book. God bless. But um, it was like a, a situation which I was thinking about um, like to be queer and young and a parent in central Florida. And I was like, this is what I'm the most interested in thinking about. Like, you know, what is it like to be like, it's like Florida's very red state. It's a weird ass place to be. I love Florida. It's a fucking weird place. It's like, um, and it's not kind all the time. I don't think like places are like, places don't care necessarily. <laughs> um, but it's a, uh, it was something I was thinking about, like, what was the process of being like a parent and like around people who maybe would passive aggressively be like, oh, you're a mom, like, who's the dad here? Like, what is like, I was like talking to, when I was sold this book, I was talking to my editor and was like, okay, here's this character who's like struggling. Like they're a gay mom and they're struggling in a situation where they have a son and they're, even though they're like middle-class, writing into this kind of middle class like family they're like they're struggling and my editor was like well why wouldn't they just join like a gay moms group and I was like that's not gay mom group in like Orlando like that's not like a thing but it is like but I was like this is like the kind of situation where it's like where you're like kind of feel like you're maybe you had figured out your queerness and then you decide to have a child and then what that queerness looks like when you become more and more isolated because community like when we're talking about family this idea of like built family is like very much an idea of like built community and community is so important like for like mental health for like awareness of the self for like raising children like this idea of like what it looks like when your community looks like and when you feel like your community is like abandoning you or you don't have that how that would be really isolating and how it would maybe affect the family like what does that look like so I was thinking about that a lot but yes my ex-wife did ask me and I had to say none percent <laughs> <laughs> it, rem it reminds me Kristen that my uh, well you know um 
my wife is a writer and sort of my first reader. So she's always seeing the work and it is uh, work that's close to home. I like to say the whole is fiction, so I can say the novel, but certainly parts of it are true or based on experiences and she recognizes those parts. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe more than another a reader might. Um, and I was pretty uncomfortable about it, actually. I mean, I, I felt there was certainly a space in which, um, you know, I felt like I was writing into her experience as partner writers tend to do. And so there are always questions there about who owns what parts of the material. Mm -hmm. But I was also really conscious about, you know, writing a, a little bit in various ways about my son and my son's experiences and writing for somebody who uh, didn't have sort of right reply in various ways. And, you know, I talked a lot about my, to my wife about that and um, would have almost been relieved at certain moments if she just vetoed it. And I wanted to give her power of veto if she, if she felt like exercising that. And she felt, I think, reasonably comfortable with it. But I think in a way I internalized um, that question in the book. The book doesn't have a, a dedication, although I've dedicated you know, previous books to, to my wife and to my son. Um, but the, the figure, the character sort of comes to the conclusion that he's sort of writing it for the son in a sense, writing it into that space. Um, and, and I should say my son, who's um, you know, quite a bit older than the child in the book now, um, has read some of my work, but not read this. He knows it's available. He can read it if he wants to. I'm also like, whatever you want to do, I'm not going to make you. It's not homework. Um, but we did. I was talking to him at one point about um, one of the reviews sort of described the character as a good father. And I mentioned that to him and he said, well, that's how you know it's fiction. So I think he's getting his own bag in this regard. That's amazing. There's even there's even a, a, a part in your book that, that I wrote down because I because I didn't want to forget it, which was that um, the narrator of, of Elias I'm told you about yourself says that one of the gifts of fiction is the cover it provides. A story can be 1% true and 99% made up or 99% true and 1% made up and the reader won't know the difference. Yeah, and as a British person, I particularly like that deniability <laughs> that allows me in some ways. But I think it also, allow, all of us know this, I think it allows us um, to be more vulnerable in a piece of fiction and on the page than we might be in life or for me even in a memoir I, I don't think i could say them those things in a memoir but in a piece of fiction it feels as i have um i have deniability i can take the fifth and that's actually very freeing in many ways uh, and so um someone in the uh chat has asked um would it be possible to hear the writers read a little bit from their books and i don't know we didn't speak about this before so it's okay if you don't have them on hand but if anyone does have their book on hand and wants to read just a little bit I think the the audience seems to want that so oh right, we'll grab a copy of the show <laughs> it looks like Kristen, Kristen can can start yes please okay do. I'll read it. just a few let's do, let's do this great okay <laughs> I love a spontaneous ask um Swim practice happened every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, directly after school. That gave Sammy just enough time to pick up her son, stuff a snack into him, and get over to the YMCA pool across town before practice began. Samson sat in the back seat eating his crackers and cheese while Sammy navigated traffic. According to his coach, Samson was a natural swimmer with a lot of power and great form for someone his age. Sammy had no clue if that was true. She didn't know much of anything about swimming, but she did know it was the first activity her son had ever actually seemed to enjoy. And she pushed him for other things too. He was smart. When he worked hard enough, he could do anything he wanted. And she told him that repeatedly, especially on the rare occasion when he seemed even a tiny bit interested in something. So Sammy was willing to brave the chlorine scented room, watching him swim for hours on end. The noise was deafening sometimes, all the splashing, the shrill sound of the whistle, all of it echoing off the tile walls, the kids shouts magnified to shrieks, but none of that mattered. Samson was flourishing there, that was reason enough. Hungry, Sammy asked. Through the rearview mirror, she saw him stacking up his snacks, cheese in one pile, crackers in the other, then eating them methodically. One cheese, one cracker, one sip of juice. One cheese, one cracker, one sip of juice. He didn't answer, but that was fine. Sammy could see he was okay with the cheese today. Sometimes it was trial and error. He did not like cheese that was orange. He did not like cheese that had holes in it. He did not like crackers with seeds or flavorings on them. He did not like 
orange juice. That was a weird one, not liking orange juice. All kids liked orange juice, didn't they? They lived in Florida, for God's sake. But then Sammy was pickier about food than anyone she knew, so she didn't really have any business questioning her son's preferences. I'm going to stop. I want to hear you guys read. <laughs> that was, that was great. You, Kristen. I loved that bit. Um, so, whoever's ready should go next. Yeah, Brandon, do you want to go? Yeah, and I'll just read just very short from um, the police officer that shot um, Ray Ray, the, the, the teenager. Um, this is just a, sh a short moment from when the Maria, the mother, goes to, to confront many years later the, uh, the police officer. I'm Maria Choda, I said. You shot my son Ray Ray at a shopping mall 15 years ago. Do you remember that? Surely you do. You remember shooting my son. He kept staring at the floor. He scratched at his upper lip, but he wouldn't look up at me. What I need to say to you, I said, is that I want to learn how to forgive you. That's what I have wanted for a long time, to learn how to forgive you for what you did. I've thought about this for a long time. Charlie Rich, he said weakly. He blinked, confused. Not the polygraph. I want to tell you that even though I want more than anything to forgive you, I can't, I said. I can't. You shot my son. You killed him out of your own ignorance and bigotry. I'll never be able to forgive you for that. He shook his head, confused. He kept scratching at his upper lip. On the dresser beside his bed were vials of pills and liquids. Magazines were stacked on the same dresser, hunting magazines, firearm magazines. I looked around the room while he sat there, silent. He was squinting at something on the floor. I had imagined this moment very differently with me screaming at him. I had always pictured myself hitting him repeatedly with my bare hands. The moment had finally arrived and there I was confronting him, ready to unleash my anger. But standing there now, I couldn't do it. I was not as angry as I'd expected to be. Despite my reason for being there, despite everything, I could not help but feel sad for him. The revolver, he said weakly, staring at, into the floor. And I'll stop there. Thank you. To hear you guys. Um, <laughs> I, I thought I'd read a little bit from the middle of the book. The book uh, as, uh, starts with um, a kind of catastrophic genetic test on a pregnancy and the couple ch choose uh, to have an abortion, um, which sort of haunts the narrative in various ways. And, and I was thinking a little bit about this section um, uh, yesterday, actually, when the marches were taking place across the country. Um, and as you said, the, the, the father is a college teacher, a literature teacher. At the father's college comes the day to teach Hemingway's hills like white elephants, the abortion story that never mentions the word abortion. It's a classic, a staple, the textbook example of subtext. He's been dreading it. Half the class misses it always. Their reactions when it's explained to them range from a penny dropping, oh, to grudging resistance. Sure, that's what it could have been talking about, I guess. He looks around their faces, the faces of those who got it, searching them this time not for critical acumen, but experience, recognition. But he also resists the story. Its discretion seems perversely coy. Why shouldn't it use the word? Why, for that matter, should the most famous fiction about abortion be written by a man? He imagines a revision in which the redacted word is reinserted in every line of the dialogue, where the young woman leans across the cafe table and says, what are you talking about? Oh, you mean the abortion? where the waiter asks, anything to drink with your abortion? The bartender winks, abortion, huh? tell me about it. Where the other passengers waiting reasonably for the train stare out at the landscape and chorus, why those hills do just look like pregnant bellies. Fuck subtext, screw subtlety. The story normalizes shame. He recalls a similar technique being used in the 80s for stories about AIDS, stories that didn't name the disease. He doesn't teach those stories anymore, and he thinks if he did, his students would wonder, WTF? He makes a mental note to stop teaching hills like white elephants, to stop perpetuating the unspeakableness, to replace it with Alice Walker's The Abortion, or Anne Sexton's The Abortion, or Something Anything by Grace Paley, said to have started writing stories while recuperating from, you guessed it, her abortion. 
Thank you so much, Peter. That was wonderful. Um, all of the books, I highly, highly recommend that everybody who's tuning in to this event um, goes in and, and clicks in. There's a link below. Um, so consider, please consider um, ordering the books. And I think it's time for us, unfortunately, to say goodbye. Um, but I just want to thank, I want to thank all of you, Peter, Kristen, Brandon. Um, I'm so grateful for the time that I've spent with your novels um, and just for the time that we spent together this evening. Um, and, and also, um, please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which this year is celebrating its 16th year of presenting free literary programming. And I think that's it for us. Thank you, Kendall. Great to see you guys. Thank you, Kendall. Kristen, thank you. Peter, thank you. It's an honor. Thank to you, guys. Here. Thank you. It was lovely. Bye, everyone.